Transmitting to you from Old Heart Radio. <laughs> Way off. <laughs> and we're going to start recording another episode of Matinee Edition. That's right. <laughs> Way off. Uh, you got to do, do the steak face to with the bass. Really got to get into it. Oh, yeah. Yes, I mean, I want to smell it over Zoom if we were playing the oh. bass, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, episode 59, we are here, hot dogs. Uh, that's it. That's, you know, it's the truth. We are the truth, and this is the way to record a matinee edition <laughs> this, podcast. This is the way. <laughs> uh, can you what tell a, what we're talking about today? What an <laughs> unintentional, I think, segue. <laughs> uh like i i'm just gonna start talking about man because it's been i i watched it yesterday i didn't get to watch the season finale of mandalorian the day it came out uh because yeah i watched it the morning of uh fuck off the morning <laughs> I, had just, br- I, I, had, I, had, I had breakfast and i was just like we're gonna sit down and watch the mandalorian that sounds like a pleasant start to the day you know it was a lovely start to the day yeah. oh god i'm jealous uh but anyway i finally got around to watching it i I was so bitter though, dude, because like leading up to the, it, it came out, it came out on, uh, and and then like the two days leading up to me watching it, I had like I was like avoiding spoilers, and then like boom, I hopped on the old heart and space twit that. Oh <laughs> no! And the, yeah, I hopped on our Twitter and like immediately got spoiled, and I was like, "Fuck this <laughs> shit!" <laughs> I was like, "No." Uh, did it stop my joy though? Absolutely not, dude. Because this episode, fucking, like, I was just so stoked about this episode. Oh, so good. Going into I love it. Love that Bo Katan came back. Yes. One. Absolutely, man. They assembled a fucking awesome crew. Like, dude, it was, it was so sick. It was so good. You had Fennec, Boba Fett, Bo Katan. What's the other lady? I, oh, um, I'm forgetting her, I'm forgetting her name. I, I am. I can't remember Bo-Katan's the character's goon, name. Number yeah, yeah, one. The, yeah, yeah, the goon. <laughs> she got in a fight with Boba Fett, and uh, honestly, she held her own, which I'll, which I'll say. Dude, that, little, that little jetpack suplex oh, was that, pretty wicked. That was fucking wild. I was like, good on you, man. <laughs> like, uh, you have the... Uh, who else, man? Obviously, the fucking Mando and... Uh, uh, Cara Dune. Yeah, Cara Dune. I always forget her name. Cara Dune. Yeah, no. Uh, Jesus, what a crew though. And and so we I mean basically going into it, you know what's fucking happening, right? The end yeah. of the last episode was like, I'm coming for you, Gideon. Boom. Uh but it, it was fucking it even even with so the general good. general idea of what was gonna happen, like it it was it blew it was over the top for me. Uh, did you notice one of the pilots at the beginning of the show when they hijack the uh oh yeah hijack hijack the cruiser? Yeah. One of the pilots is the dude who who was um, Daniel Whitehall, and the dude who had the oh. gun to the doctor's head. It was, he was he was the dude from Agents of Shield. I saw that. I didn't notice that, but that uh, reminds me. I saw this thing, and there was like, if you go back, there's like several actors from Agents of Shield. Oh, they're this, all over the show. In, yeah, I was like, I was like, oh, sick. <laughs> I mean, like there was some like i mean aside from, outside from that guy like that white hog character was so fucking weak to me like, i was like that's <laughs> a, I, was, I was like that's the villain that you're gonna you're gonna go out on basically yeah, right? this is this is the hill you're dying on fucking mm-hmm. evil evil shitty quick yeah but you know i i guess i'll you know whatever but that that was like an interesting <laughs> I, I thought i thought it was interesting how like after they captured uh the doctor in that in that opening scene he yeah. was like insanely helpful like did you know it? like I, I i took that as like his allegiance is not really to the empire but it's to saving his own ass i had a heart yeah okay fair enough i i had a hard time reading that i was like i was at first i was like i was like what's his intent is he like trying to lure them into a fucking trap or is yeah. it like you know something else but yeah he seemed pretty like anyway pretty genuine in his like giving of information but yeah. so that kind of just kicked off like I don't know. I, I guess like the rest of the show, the rest of the episode, because Dude, the rest of the episode was pretty much spent in the, in the cruiser at that point. Action packed. Yeah. It was great. I love seeing Boba Fett's slave one in action. 
Oh, it's, it's so badass. It's so fucking badass, dude. <laughs> like, uh, when they're like, they're kind of like, their plan was, their general plan was like, I guess, to ideally emergency dock on Moff Gideon's cruiser and like pretend Boba Fett would just pretend to be like, you know, after him or whatever. Yeah. That, that apparently, that really didn't work out too well. <laughs> like, I think, yeah. like, I think no matter like what their situation was, as soon as they were like, as soon as they just like kept going at the cruiser, even though the, I don't know, pilot or whatever told, like told them to like hold off and let the TIE fighters blast Boba Fett out of the sky. Yeah. Uh, I feel like that immediately was just like, I know who these fucking people Dead are. Dead <laughs> Gideon's running down to Baby Yoda. Yeah, because Gideon's not fucking. I mean, and you see it later in the episode, but Gideon, like, he has eyes and ears like everywhere. Like it seems like. Yeah. Like, so, you know, so that was that was pretty fucking cool though. Like I, yeah, that whole sequence of them like flying at the cruiser and stuff. So. The yeah. that was pretty awesome, and then it just it just gets going right after that, dude. For real. Uh, and Number one. Some, for a 57 year old woman, Ming Na Wen has some fucking moves still. It's she was nuts. doing, she was doing like, she was kicking people. She did a, she roundhouse kicked a motherfucker and then shot him in the stomach. That's what I'm saying, man. Like, you know, like, it's, I don't think I could do that right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Ming Na, definitely not. So she's she, the choreography that, that in the- my mind when I found out that she's 57. She's on the yeah. brink of being a senior citizen, and this yeah, is the man. shit she's doing. Soon she can order off the off the like the the senior menu at Denny's and or the <laughs> oh. the, the honored menu as they oh, call honored. it. Oh, honored! Yes, yes. I always loved that. Uh, you're not senior. You're 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 an honored guest at this point. Oh, once you hit six quite, quite. Uh But yeah, no the 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 fucking fight choreography the the way they like cruised through like basically just swept through the ship like that whole sequence of them kind of just like taking out stormtroopers yeah. along the way was really fucking cool and there was yeah. some cool there's some fun humor in there like a dude like cara dune's like gun jammed and then she just like beat the fuck out of like a few stormtroopers with it i was just <laughs> like gun. damn dude <laughs> i would say and they're cool they're cool little shots intermixed yeah. in there as well like the two like the two mandalorians dropping off the side of the floating oh, pillar yeah and then ascending up it's, just, like that was, yeah i know it's just yeah. it's just these sweet little moments you're yeah, like man. oh this is a genuinely well directed and well thought out concept which and, also speaking we need to give props to the director peyton reed oh, who we yeah. all know from ant-man yeah dude really good job with this episode <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, after like a whole season of solid directors like what yeah. a way to stop to like end the season, like bring Peyton Which, Reed in and just like it blows top it all up. It blows my mind. He did. He also directed one episode earlier in the season. Mm-hmm. Pretty sure it was the second episode. <clears throat> oh, was that, that was the ice caves. Yeah. I think that was the ice caves. So like we, we might not be giving <laughs> him enough credit for being a good director. I don't know, man. I mean, even looking at those Ant-Man movies, like they're really, they're really fine. Like they're good humor. They're good. Like there's good pace to them. The action's fun. Like well done. Yeah. You know, like I don't know. It's cool. He's a he's. Yeah, I feel like you're right. Uh, maybe this doesn't give enough. They, he doesn't get enough credit. We were talking about this before the show, but the um the Dark Trooper theme. Oh, is dude. so cool. The fucking music in this episode. Like you've been talking about the music all season, and and it, like it definitely stood out to me in this episode. Yeah. Like it was, a, it, it was like their theme, like they're just because after you learn that they're droids and you see them kind of like warming up and like all this it's like stuff, Terminator. Dude, it was fucking, yeah, it was, it was, dude, it was like a, I love the Terminator. That's I think why I like, I like those, them so much, but <laughs> like it was just the, their theme just like perfectly fit the mood and like the imagery that they were capturing with that. It was just so yeah. awesome and driving and this like elect the electronic as like, yeah, it was just that like you super know. percussive synth. Yeah, dude, it was so fucking dope. This like, it's uh, what's the cat's name again? Ludwig what or whatever? Ludwig Gorison. Ludwig yeah. Gorison. Okay. Composer and producer for Childish Gambino. So. That's what I mean. Like, and that's like you know, like I said, you. Like, it's very you, interesting because he's the third composer to work on Star Wars, in like the live action series. So there's John Williams, and then oh, the dude who did Up and some of the Marvel movies. I'm forgetting his name. He did. He did Rogue One. Oh, yeah. And um, 
but then Ludwig Gorsen's the third. And it's like stylistically, it's so different from John Williams. Mm-hmm. But the but the key is that it still works. Like it oh, fits. for sure. Well like I, I mean, genuinely think the Mandalorian theme is gonna be looked back at with the same kind of reverence as like the main Star Wars theme. Oh absolutely. It's, it's dude. going to be iconic. The Mandalorian it's it's kind of, it's already almost there, I feel like. You know, it's yeah. it, because because it's like not only is it just like a, a kind of fun piece of music, it 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 immediately invokes like the imagery of the mandalorian to those who've like who've like watched it and so it it definitely like it the music and and the overall just like soundtrack that they've put together for this whole season has just been fucking fantastic yeah like uh i I, have have you listened have you listened to the lo-fi star wars station on youtube I've not. I need every to. every like third song is like a, a play on the Mandalorian theme. Ugh. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. There's some really creative shit on there, and if you really if you like Star Wars, yeah, boom, it's cake. But yeah, uh, I want to I want I want to quickly point out the creative use of the um, the Berserker staff in uh-huh. killing the stormtrooper. <laughs> he fucking snapped his neck with a spear. I just thought that was so over. Like I was like, I was like, what an interesting thing to do. Like at this moment, like he takes out the other dude really quick, right? And then he's like, then he takes the time to like snap that dude's neck with the spear. Yeah. And I was just like, just take him out. Just take him out really quick. You just like, just poke him. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like he jabbed the other one in the stomach, and then he like, just snapped the other one's neck. That's was like you treat yeah, anyway. That yeah. staff is fucking wicked. Especially well, during, holy especially shit. during the fight with uh with Gideon. Yeah, man. Who doesn't die. <laughs> I was so honestly, I just I was I, I was just like they need to fucking kill him, man. Like anyway, yeah. but the the fight, the fight between Mando and, and Gideon with the dark saber, like that was one of the fights that everybody knew was going to happen in this episode. Yeah. Right? right, and everybody wanted to fucking see that Beskar staff go against that fucking dark saber, and it so was cool. so dope, dude. Like, it's so cool. Like I loved every time they were like interacting the the you know the two weapons. Yeah. Uh, after a certain amount of time, you'd start seeing the staff glow, and I started getting worried. I was like, "Is that going to stay? If if Gideon keeps that like pressure on there long enough, yeah. will it eventually cut through his staff?" And I was like, "Oh fuck, dude, <laughs> that thing held. That thing held up, man. Because it didn't, it's it didn't, so sick." Yeah. He did that. There was one move that I was like, my jaw hit the floor just for like the quality of direction and fight choreography where like he blocked and then kicked the staff around. Oh yeah. And like kind of like tried to get him from the top. Yeah. It was, that was super fucking dope. I, and honestly, I mean, who's under the helmet? Pedro Pascal. Oh, I will quickly say <laughs> the, like earlier in the episode when he had him pinned against the wall, the the uh the dark tree red and pinning against the wall punching him in the head keep seeing memes of being like looks like Oberon found his helmet dude for, the- <laughs> for real though <laughs> i was like i was like oh shit his face is gonna get fucked up and then <laughs> then i realized like the, the helmet's keeping him protected but yeah i was just it's, like wow what a say- way to go out in two different series <laughs> i will say that image the, of him getting punched in the face that over and sh- over again it was like w- it made it creepier to me. Oh, like it for made sure. It more unsettling. Oh, absolutely. Well, and that that like it just I don't know, like that was just such a like, intense sequence. Like yeah. then that alone, yeah, that was just because it just was so, like unrelenting and just like continued and you're just like fuck, dude. Like it's not nothing's, gonna stop until you're yeah. like dust, man. Like nothing's nothing's doing anything to it either. Which I will say, like, this episode was so tense. We yeah. You didn't get into the end of it. Number one, I want to say plot hole in the greater Star Wars continuity. What? Fucking Sabine, the Mandalorian from Rebels, mm. just hands Bogotan the dark saber, and she's yeah. all right with it. That's I, I I didn't understand, man. I was like, this shit is fucking ridiculous. Just take the goddamn <laughs> dark saber from him. He even went through the process of, you know, he was like, he was like, uh, you know, like I uh, yield, I yield. You can have it. Like, there you go. Like you won if you needed to. I don't know. It was fucking yeah. like I was just like, that's crazy. But that immediately, you know, you know, that's just going to set up a conflict for season three. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, which will be interesting for sure. But the dark saber wasn't the only lightsaber on that fucking ship that night. Oh, and, what, what's it leading up to that? The tension that was building. Oh, 
when, thought, when when the dark troopers were punching the door. Oh my god, dude, that, that was, was everybody was, setting up. Oh, it was that was exactly nuts. the type of terror that uh, they tried to capture with Terminator, and like that was that yeah. like that was James Cameron's thing, right? He wanted to create this like this you know like force that just wouldn't stop until it fucking got you, and that's what yeah. those dark troopers were doing, dude. They had the blast doors down, and they're just like fuck it we're just gonna punch through and that was just yeah. that was fucking gnarly dude like i was and it got you like you kind of started feeling that anxiety like building you're just like holy yeah. shit what's gonna happen when they get through <laughs> so um i want to so cutting through that we saw the the entrance of a single x-wing oh uh, and i god. and i swear to god man like i there were there are three options there's jedi that grogu talked with mm-hmm Ezra Bridger from Rebels. It's Cal Kestis, played by Dominic Monaghan from the Fallen Order game. Oh, yeah. Or it was Luke. And I was like, fuck, it's not going to be Luke. I, it was fucking Luke. Right? I was so cool. It now, was the most fucking awesome thing I, I, I saw on top of this, everything that, else that happened this season. A lot, a lot of people are pointing out how, like, shot for shot – that scene where he's going through the hallway mm-hmm. is extremely similar to the scene from Rogue One with Darth yeah. Vader. Purposely done. Uh, his entrance, uh, as soon as the doors open, and you just see his silhouette, his hooded silhouette, and he like boom, so he lights his fucking lightsaber in that like similar way that Darth Vader did right in Rogue One. Oh my god! And then just watching him cut through, like okay, so you, they're like watching this, you know. Jedi on the cameras tears yeah. through all these dark troopers, and then like, but when he gets that hallway, terrified. Gideon shit his fucking pants. You could tell, like you could, tell. <laughs> <laughs> like, like. I saw this meme, and it was like, it was, it was just that. It was like Gideon, like, like as soon as you realize the most powerful Jedi in the galaxy is coming after you, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like. Uh, but as soon as I think Luke got to that that hallway that was filled with the dark troopers outside the the bridge, that. Him like the the fucking like choreography of and the smoothness of him just cutting yeah. through those fucking dark troopers, and then like that one that he like just like pauses and then just crushes with the force. So was satisfying. So satisfying. I was like, oh my fucking god! Like, which I think this really puts <laughs> into perspective the power levels of every character. For sure, because it's like, oh, like they were gonna fuck over the Mandalorian squad. Yeah. And it took one Jedi. <laughs> one Jedi to cut through them all. All of them. Yeah. As a fucking... Like, Luke like, is ridiculous. Like, as a fanboy of Star Wars, like, you never got to see, in the original trilogy, all you got was those, those fucking, you know, episode four, five, and six. And so you got just like a slight glimpse at how powerful Luke was kind of becoming. Yeah, and then so just like to finally see that character like in a little more action with a little more even like I don't want to talk about the sequels because like you know that was a different side. It's it. very different. But like to see him more in his fucking prime was just such a fucking gem of a moment. Like it was, I was just like, I think my mouth was like open and smiling the entire uh, yeah, time. Yeah, like totally, that. dude. Uh, but we got to talk about how sad that ending was. It oh was, God. It got me, dude. It got me so hard. I was like, Grogu, don't go. And then I was like, but you should. No. Oh, I was like, fuck. It was I was sad. like, this, it, it, it's, it's extremely well acted as well. Mm-hmm. Like, finally, Mando takes off his helmet in front of strangers. Yeah. There was a, somebody pointed out, like, Pedro Pascal, when he has his helmet off, never uses peripheral vision. Mm. Yeah, as a yeah. symptom of him existing within that helmet, he is always looking forward directly at someone. Yeah, which is an interesting character trait for him to continue, and that just shows yeah. how, like, how, in- how you know, it's not just him in a suit, like freewheeling acting. Like he actually yeah. is like involved in the character, which I really respect. Uh, and it's like it's when when you look at the Mandalorian, it was just like uh, these like here are the like villain of the week type shit in the first season. He got Gideon at the end. Yeah. Season two was a lot more, this is the direction they need to go. And they wrapped it up and there's this nice emotional note between baby Yoda and the Mandalorian. And it was very nice. Now in season three, when that eventually comes out after something we're going to talk about in a moment, Mm -hmm. we're 
they're not going to have to write into all these plot contrivances of like, oh, Baby Yoda has a sitter. <laughs> Paul Mando does something badass. Exactly. It frees Mando's character up to kind of do more. And yeah. so... Well, I do hope that we eventually like see Luke's Jedi Academy or something. So good. So dope. I want <laughs> if, if the Mandalorian ends, that's how I want it to end. Yeah. Just being like, oh, we're just going to visit. Like, like if, a uh, growing Grogu. Yeah, and, and and then we can hard cut to him getting mowed down by Kylo Ren, thirty oh, years in the future. Shit, dude, that was like I think one of those things circulating around. It was like, did Kylo hurt Grogu? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, dude, it was just a great way to end the season. I'm fucking, I was, I'm so happy with that season. I'm, I'm can't wait. I think uh, my girlfriend said it best. Uh, I can't wait to rewatch it. So <laughs> yeah. you know. And I can't wait for December of 2021 to watch The Book of Boba Fett. Yeah. Where it looks uh, like he's running the old crime syndicates of Tatooine. So, yeah, the the, the end the delete the, or the end credit scene of of the season finale was Boba Fett showing up at Jabba the Hutt's palace or formerly Jabba the Hutt's palace, shooting everybody in the fuck in his fucking did, way. Did you and, catch? Did you catch that the dude who was sitting at the who was like the head? Yeah, yeah. He, he said Mc- later on. He said McClunky. McClunky. <laughs> he said McClunky. They're <laughs> owning it. Well, you gotta keep it. Uh, but yeah, I guess that's setting up like maybe you know him returning to Tatooine and doing whatever Boba Fett feels like he needs to do there. I mean, it seems like he's yeah. gotten attached to the place. Like that's that's yeah. for sure. So that'll be kind of interesting to see what fucking develops out of that. I'm so we stoked. Get, that we get more Ming Na Wen. We get more. Yeah, more Boba Fett. Who's gonna? Who's going to complain? Dude, it'll be fucking dope. I can't wait. But that we will have to wait for until 2021. So, on that note, with next up on Disney Plus, we got WandaVision. Yeah, man. About, th- uh, about three weeks or so until then. Yeah. Well, obviously, uh, you know, the way that they've made the Mandalorian, the technology that they used to make Mandalorian has been able to successfully kind of, especially in these like weird times, successfully kind of like, make a really like studio worthy looking show yeah quick and so uh you know you can see marvel coming up with stuff i think they're going to continue to like use that and you know as they should it's, it's just interesting with the you know they're breaking into the streaming and right now at this time when like people are kind of like there's this great conversation about it right like everybody's yeah. because <laughs> of warner brothers and hbo like everybody's now wondering like is streaming as great as everybody wants it to be yeah will it be helping the actors the people on the back end of production as much as the studio and so you know like a couple of things i've seen recently you know have been kind of interesting because you have a lot of directors coming out you know christopher nolan um dennis wait his name no no uh the guy that's making dune uh oh yeah uh, i know you're talking about but anyway, these people are coming out and they're, you know, talking about how this move to putting movies directly on streaming is going to really drastically affect the cinematic experience, the yeah. the way movies are funded, all sorts of stuff, which are very valid yeah. points. But there's also, you know, this other side and, and Feige over at Marvel was the person, was a, one of the people that I read this week that that kind of mentioned that like people need to accept the fact that streaming is a huge way that people want to consume their entertainment now. Absolutely. And that's only going to grow. That appetite's only going to grow in the future. So you might as well start trying to match it. Yeah. I will say, I mean like on a, on a good note of like the good things you can get out of streaming. Yeah. I I watched the queen's gambit over the last week. Absolutely. Have you seen it yet? I mean, I'm like, a, I'm like four episodes into it. So it's, it's pretty good. It, yeah, absolutely. I would call it a, definitely a cinema worthy drama slash sort of sports movie, but it's yeah. like, if it was a movie in this case, it's a short, it's a limited series, which is what I think we're going to continuously get more and more of. Yeah. Like well, in the form of that Ahsoka show, like we're going to continue to get these high quality TV shows coming out. Maybe that's the future and we just get a way more curated theater experience. Because don't get us wrong. Like yeah. we want that back. Dude, I miss as, as possible. I, I miss going to the theater and like immersing myself in a fucking movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm at a house right I'm I'm like looking forward to watching Wonder Woman eighty four on, on uh December on December twenty fifth when it drops. Yeah. 
Uh, you owe us money, HBO, for that plug. Uh, but <laughs> but what a free month. You know, the, the thing I'm not looking forward to is the fact that like, you know, my dogs will probably bark at some point during the movie. You know, yeah. I'll, you know, all you know, all these other little things because I'm enjoying it at home. But it is also nice to still have entertainment at home. It's just not the same feeling, and you know. I don't know. It's it's hard to like, I don't want to like, there's no side to pick in this argument because it's like, it's like both sides are right. Like one yeah. is definitely more consumer friendly. One's more one consumer is, friendly. But one is more of a experience. Yeah. Well, and one kind of retains the value, the, uh, the artistic value a little more. I'd well, say. I will say this sort of lends itself to Scorsese's interview regarding Joker and oh, yeah, yeah. MCU from about a year ago now. Yeah. That, he made the point that like you can make stuff like the Irishman that wouldn't make money in theaters, but will draw people to a platform like Netflix. Absolutely. You can, and maybe we need to shift our expectations for what we want out of certain mediums. If you want an intimate drama that isn't really a spectacle, it isn't a blockbuster, maybe that is better to watch on your home TV. But if you're going and watching Avengers Endgame, go and fucking watch it on a big ass screen with surround sound because that's how that movie's made. If you're watching a uh, tenant, yeah. it's made to be watched on that. Maybe we just need to adjust our expectations for what specific movies really should be watched in. So like, that's, I, agree. I, I feel like that's a valid way of looking at it while not fully eliminating that theater experience because we all love it. Yeah. Well, I know I- very few people that actively dislike going to the movies. Fair enough. Me too. I can't think of a single one, honestly, off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, I can think of one. And it's my dad. <laughs> uh, you know why? Yeah, it's, it's because he gets cold. Oh my God. Uh, I mean, I, yeah, it's, it's like, there's, there's ways of preserving that and kind of like, I like, I like that, you know, like kind of shifting our expectations of our experience, our different types of experiences. Yeah. Uh, and, but like also, you know, like, one of the one of the things people are worried about like the uh, god i wish i remember his name uh, the the director of the upcoming dune movie he's like he made a very valid point of saying that his movie he went into the negotiations de- demanding that he was able to make a two part movie because it's such a like a dense work uh yeah. the uh, the fact alone that the first part of the movie will be directly put up online will immediately cut into the the money that that movie makes right yeah yeah and absolutely will, and that'll immediately look make the second movie uh harder to fully finance because it'll look like it made less money and and so people want to give out less for it and so it, it's just it's just it, it's an, it, there's so many layers to it yeah but, but you know one of the other things that i i read that marvel's fucking doing like uh shocker here that marvel's kind of spearheading is that they're trying to start renegotiating or negotiating contracts that if movies go to streaming or just go online, people like directors and uh, actors and like the people, you know, involved in the movie get compensated f- like the way they would normally. Yeah. And, and so yeah, like, that's just going to have to be the new standard, I think. You know? Absolutely. I feel like, like I, I was thinking of this recently. It's like, we can all like, we can't really pity a multimillion like per oh, movie no. actor at this point no but the people that will be hurt by this are the normal people that work on movies behind the scenes and get so little credit when the end process is done yeah like how many gaffers how many lighting guys like how many exactly. techs are going to be hurt by this exactly. like that's that's where that's where the actual ramifications are going to show up yeah and so that that'll be interesting to kind of like see how they navigate those waters yeah. But you know that conversation's going to keep going as as you know the they m- continue to try to like meld those platforms together. Yeah. Uh, I th- I think it's fascinating. I'm going to be so intrigued to see what the end conclusion of all this is. Oh, for sure. Uh speaking about the end conclusion, we're getting near the end of this podcast. So, Ooh, being as yes. this is probably the podcast that we are going to re- this is the podcast that we are recording before Christmas. So we're not going to record the holidays. After- the holidays, whatever, yeah, sorry, whatever, whatever, you want. What, whatever holiday you celebrate, whatever, whatever you want to fucking call it. I don't give a shit about that. Uh, like Yule Tide for all the fuck's sake. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we got to run through. We have fifty seconds. We got to run through our favorite holiday movies. What's we, your we, have top? The, we have we have the exact same one. 
No, we, oh, do we? National yeah, Lampoon's we do. Christmas Vacation? Yes, we do. Oh, my God. So, oh. as much as Chevy Chase, as we all learned, can, you know, was a douchebag and hard to work with, this movie <laughs> is a holiday. Is anybody fuck. really surprised? No, absolutely not. That dude came from, like, came from money. He was entitled the entire time. And, like, he was, he, it's just, it is what it is. Uh, but what a fucking funny movie. Like, there's still it's some, great. like, there's, there's some cringe moments because of, like, you know, as we've moved on as a culture. But <laughs> in, the, in the same way of like how, how like, uh, oh, a Christmas story has become cringy. Right? Oh, for sure. Exactly. There's just, there's just like, it's like with anything that's kind of, that's dated, there's, there's probably some things that we've hopefully learned from. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll say. But there's just some really fucking fantastic moments in this movie. One of oh, my favorite, absolutely. favorite parts is just Clark Griswold going, Joy to the world. He like smashes his fucking <laughs> lights together. Yeah, that's stuff. funny. Oh, man. I just, I lose it every time. Uh, I, think, just, I, I still think my favorite is when the fucking redneck cousin shows up with the oh, boss God. in the bow tie. Yeah, yeah. Uncle Eddie, dude. Uncle, Uncle Eddie. Uncle Eddie is a fucking idiot. <laughs> that guy's also oh that God. guy in real life. The actor is a fucking nut job. Yeah, Randy Quaid. I think. I think also Randy Quaid. Him, right after the podcast sh- with me. <laughs> right after he shows up and he's wearing the fake turtleneck under the sweater is also great. Like on they don't ever mention it, but it's just yeah, perfect. I oh, mean, his, that's one of the things I love about like his, some of his outfits throughout that movie are just gems. There's that one he has like, he has like, he's wearing skin, a blue skin tight, like green pants and like a fucking like gnarly, like really tight sweater on. Yeah. And he's just like chugging eggnog. <laughs> like, <laughs> what, what, after he, after he kidnaps the boss, a oh, man wearing a baby blue leisure suit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. It's a gem. I love it. If you haven't, honestly watch national lampoon's christmas vacation get out of my face uh but there's a couple more you got i think you should probably you should, uh, probably, you should probably put down jingle christmas, all the way is one of great. them that's it arnold schwarzenegger and sinbad classic combination you know Amen. what i mean put those cookies down now <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking uh, fantastic yeah yeah you, you gotta watch you gotta watch elf come on elf of course elf is uh, great there's this great series on Netflix called How Did This, or not How Did This Get Made. That's a, a podcast. It's uh, called The Movies That Made Us. And they did a holiday yeah. epi- edition and they did a, uh, an episode on Elf. And one of the fun yeah. things I learned about that, because I've never actually watched Elf. Is, really? Uh, yeah. I, I'm planning on watching it this year. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a good movie. But like they apparently like when they well, when Buddy gets to New York and he's like kind of running around New York, all of that was actually filmed like on the go and yeah. just like on the spot and most of the people that they interact with aren't actors they're just real people <laughs> i've that they, seen like, that before and i was so like i was like that's I fucking think. funny man uh there's that there's uh was okay you i think you were just about to say it, but i can't remember the name of it uh it's on hulu there's like the new like that it's like a newer movie oh the uh the happiest season the that's one it. where okay, it's yeah. the uh it's, it's like, a lesbian couple with kristen yeah. stewart and kristen stewart dan levy has a role in it like yeah Dan Levy's hilarious in that. It's such a it's it's it the concept a really the fun concept, movie. The fun concept movie. of it is hilarious. Oh I'm just God, like yeah. the like not having <laughs> a woman who hasn't come out to her family yet bring her significant other home. Yeah, without like, telling with, and acting like she's an orphan. Yo, that, oh my God, some, so the hard. bits were so fucking funny. Yeah. I would definitely recommend watching that one this year because it, yeah. it it really was was a good. I time. do I do think that one's gonna shape out to be like one of the future like movies that people look back on oh probably yeah it'll yeah. be a it's a modern classic modern classic per se <laughs> just like this one of, the few <laughs> movies, one of the few movies i've enjoyed with kristen stewart oh my god for sure <laughs> i that's i honestly can't think of another one off the top of my head <laughs> me either i'm really <laughs> hunting here man <laughs> so on that uh, note new uh, moon <laughs> new moon <laughs> You just gotta pick one of them. Pick one of the Twilights. It's good. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Which one's the one with Michael Sh- with Michael Scene? <laughs> Michael Scene. <laughs> All right. On that note, I think we're gonna wrap up this podcast. I do just want to say, whatever you do, celebrate if that's your thing. I hope you have a good merry time for whatever it's fucking worth. Uh, yeah. I just baked a what? shitload of cookies today. So I'm going to be having gingerbread as soon as we get off. I'm going to get like nothing but a sugar buzz on for the next five days. <laughs> so, Happy holidays. 
I hope you all take care. Thanks for listening. As always, hot dogs. Uh, please go on Instagram for God's sake and follow us on Instagram at Old Heart Radio. There it is. Uh, message, message Oatly for us. Uh, please. Also, message Randy Quaid if he has a social media account and see if he'll <laughs> record he? a podcast he with him. I would love to interview Uncle Eddie. Okay. I want to make that dream happen. I'm going to harass him if I see him on social media. Sorry, Randy. Uh, yeah. He has him. He's there. Let's follow him. <laughs> That's oh, my God. <laughs> He's fucking nuts, dude. Uh, but like I said, hot dogs, you're not nuts because you listen to this podcast. Congratulations. Yes. So peace and chicken grease.